when it comes to running a law firm, there are so many things that need to happen. And when you normally start at a law firm, most people have no money. So all you have is time and you're wearing a thousand hats. And I always tell people it's your job to create a position where your time becomes worth more than your money and start bringing in other experts. That's why I think it's awesome that we've got Arjun Robbins on today. For those who don't know, founder of How to Manage Enterprises, president of How to Manage a Small Law Firm, the leading, largest, biggest, and best provider of outside managing partner, chief operating officer, and chief financial officer services exclusively for the solo and small law firm single shareholder market. I'm super excited for us to chat with Arjun about his story, about how to market a law firm, about what How to Manage does and everything in this episode. Uh, before we dive into that, I want to talk about our last episode that aired two days ago. We had Elise Bowie on. We talked about the difference between legal solutions and legal solutions. Elise talked to us about her story going from just herself, adding on a couple staff up to 42 people now, and the culture that she's built to do that. Um, I urge you to watch that episode after you're done here, but we've got Arjun, so let's dive right in. Arjun, thank you so much for being with us today. Jordan, thank you for inviting me to be here. So I'd love to start with your story. I think so many of, of our listeners and watchers know how to manage, but they may not know your background as much. Okay. Um, well, I'm flattered that you think so many people know about how to manage a small law firm. Um, I kind of wake up every day and assume that's not true. <laughs> so I keep trying to share it with more and more people. Uh, my background. Um, so I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Um, I graduated from college and realized I was completely unprepared to enter the real world. Uh, fortunately, I had access to some resources, and so I decided to go to law school because I sure as hell wasn't going to go to medical school, and I didn't think I could make it through an MBA because I can't do math. So law school was like the easiest route for me. Um, I ended up graduating from law school in two and a half years instead of three, and worked for a federal bankruptcy judge. I worked at the US trustee's office and 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 I I really thought I was going to be like a bankruptcy attorney, a business attorney, a transactional, you know, do that kind of thing. Um well to make a long story short, I ended up getting admitted to the bar quicker than I expected to because of the whole mishmash of 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 graduating early and everything. And so I started my own law firm. And it was it was basically a disaster. Um, there has never been a multi-million dollar, highly successful law firm called the, the, the highly successful law firm of rjohnrobbins.com never existed. Uh, there was the there was the scary, unpredictable cash flow roller coaster. Uh, every day was like my first day at work kind of experience with the law firm i discovered that the florida bar I, i'm a member of the florida bar was still am i discovered oh, that the florida congratulations bar, or i'm sorry as a fellow florida bar attorney oh florida bar is great uh better than a lot of bars let me tell you that as much as, as much as we want to complain about the florida bar i have since had the opportunity to interact with state bars all over the country and we don't know how good we've got it here in florida uh, the Florida bar really does a lot more for its members than some state bars do for theirs. Anyway, very true. Um, so, uh, I discovered that the Florida bar had a department called the law office management assistance service. Um, and that was created back in 1980 when the, when the president of the Florida bar at the time, who was an entrepreneurial type of lawyer, type of law firm owner, he, he real Sam Smith, he realized in, in back in the late seventies that the Florida bar was prosecuting more lawyers for bar grievances that started from a law firm management problem and marketing problems than any other cause. So most people think, oh, lawyers who get suspended or, dis or disciplined, they must be drunks. They must be stealing from the trust account. They must be bad lawyers. Not true at all. <clears throat> The, the leading cause, 54% of the bar grievances that are filed nationally, not just in Florida, start off as a an avoidable and profit-destroying law firm management problem. 
Um, and 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 so Sam Smith realized this, and he created the the, the law office management assistance service to to as a preventative measure. Let's fix the problem, not just prosecute lawyers for having the problem. After all, what did they teach you in law school about the business of running a law firm? Nothing. What do they teach you in law school about marketing a law firm? Uh, just PR about what not to do. They, they, you know, what they teach us in law school is, oh, if you're a good enough lawyer, you won't have to worry about marketing. Bullshit. That is the most naive, stupid, fantasy land, ridiculous, egotistical thing. I mean, it's, it's just dangerously, recklessly bad advice. Uh, what do they teach you in law school about meeting with prospective clients and systematically, predictably, professionally, ethically, profitably converting them from a prospect into a paying client? Not a, not a second. Oh, if you're a good enough lawyer, no, that's just stupid. I mean, that's just so, st and, and, and consequently, lawyers learn how to sell legal services from other lawyers who learn how to sell legal services, who learn how to sell legal services from other lawyers who don't know shit about how to ethically, professionally, profitably, reliably, predictably convert a prospective client into a paying client. And it becomes a painful, tedious, unprofitable, soul-crushing experience because they go into it and say, you should hire my law firm because let me tell you where I went to law school and let me tell you how hard I'll work and let me tell you about all my credentials and let me tell you all about how great I am and let me educate you about how much I know about the law. And then when the client or the prospective client says no, it's like a personal rejection of you. Anyway, so I learned nothing in law school about marketing, sales, uh, documenting processes, systems, procedures. What did you learn in law school about that? Nothing. nothing. Right? Hiring, training, managing, making a profit with staff. Not a Nothing. Financial controls, 12-month forward-looking budget, cash flow projections, cost of goods sold, understanding where the real financial profit in a law firm actually comes from and how to keep track of it and predict it. I don't even think we talked about money, period, let alone how to use it in the right way. Well, when I was in law school, what they taught me is just be a good enough lawyer and the magic law firm management L's will just take care of everything else for you. Well, of course, we know that's fantasy, right? That doesn't stop hundreds of thousands of lawyers all over this country from believing in that fantasy and getting, bam, just jammed by it because it just destroys your business and really takes a toll on the person. So long story short, it was doing that to me because I believed I had heard this fantasy and I discovered that the Florida Bar had created a department to help lawyers fix this problem. And I called them and I was and I described the problems that I was experiencing. I described the effect that I was experiencing in my business, in my law firm. And they said, not in these words exactly, but essentially what they said was, look, those are effects. They're very predictable effects. They're very familiar effects. These effects are traced back to certain fundamental law firm management best practices, which are well known to people who actually know what the hell they're doing when it comes to the business of running a law firm. And if you'll fix this cause, the effect will get better. To make a very long story short, I fixed the first effect. I fixed the first cause, the effect got better. I went back to them again. They gave me another cause. I fixed it, the effect got better. I, I kept going back. I just basically began to egregiously abuse my privileges of access to the Florida hey. Department until I just became like one of those regulars. And I said, you know, one day I, I'm having so much more fun with the business of running my law firm, fixing the business of my law firm than the, than the practice law. Do you have any recommendations of books or other resources? And to make a very long story short, they ended up recruiting me. And I became the first lawyer in the history of the state of Florida and still the only lawyer in the history of the state of Florida, which is the fourth largest state bar in the country, by the way, to serve as a full-time small law practice management advisor, which means for four years, my life was basically divided into about two weeks out of every year. I'd be in the office fielding calls from lawyers who were having every kind of law firm management problem you can possibly imagine marketing, sales, management, staffing, financial controls, mindset, 
personal problems owing to the problems of the law firm, buying a law firm, selling a law firm, starting a law firm, growing a law firm, retiring, you name it. Um, and, and when I wasn't in the office dealing with these issues, hands on with, with dozens and dozens and dozens of lawyers every single week, over and over and over and over again, I was out in the field fixing broken law firms because when the Florida Bar, Discipl when the Florida Bar Disciplinary Committee recognized that this lawyer had violated the bar rules because of an avoidable law firm management problem, causes lead to effects, they would say, look, before we give this person their license back to just to put them into more trouble again, why don't we send the Florida Bar Lomas Department out there to actually figure out what's going wrong and tell them how to fix it? And so for four years, I basically lived up to my neck inside of broken law firms, all different practice areas, men, women, black, white, tall, short, left-handed, right-handed, you name it. And that's really where I cut my teeth and understood that the business of the law firm is the business of the law firm is the business of the law firm. And to the extent that the seven main parts of every successful law firm, which are also the same seven main parts of every struggling law firm, to the extent that you take responsibility for these causes, the effect is more predictable flow of prospective new clients or less predictable flow of steady new clients. Uh, happier, more cooperative, more profitable clients or more pissed off clients who don't pay their bills. Uh, more leverage with better staff or less leverage with worse staff, more predictability and more profits and more stability. Or You get where I'm going with this. That's really my, my background. And then, of course, blah, 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 blah. I ended up starting the, the how to manage a small law firm back in 2009. And um, we've been in Inc. Magazine as one of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the country uh, every year since we first made the list, which was, I think, 2015, um, we manage almost 600 of some of the most profitable with the most predictable cash flow, fastest growing, most fun to own law firms. We manage over 600, uh, almost 600 of them all over the country, uh, have a full-time staff of over 120 amazing people. And I'm very blessed to now have the time to have these great interviews with cool people like you. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I, it's interesting because I love the concept, what you're talking about here, obviously having <clears throat> been, having well, still being a lawyer, but having been through it as a lawyer, having been through it for the Florida bar, having created a company around it, you all, but from that, you all have such a different perspective. Like it's not coaching. It's really getting that fractional team together. Am I right in that? Coaching is one of the tools in a good CEO's toolbox. It's not, so coaching is, let's call it a hammer, right? By the way, you know how you can tell someone you should never let them work on your car, your boat, or any kind of machinery? If you see a claw hammer in their toolbox, don't let them anywhere near your toys. Okay. But that's good. a carpenter's tool, not a mechanic's tool. Um, good to know. Coaching is a tool of a good CEO, COO, CFO, CMO. Um, saying that I am a CEO, if all I have is a hammer, is a lot like saying I'm a, I'm a mechanic, but I don't have any wrenches, I don't have any screwdrivers, I don't have any, I, I, I don't have any wire strippers, I don't have any of the tools, I just have that hammer. Well, you know what? Everything looks like a nail if all you got is a hammer, right? Totally. Um, so we fashion ourselves as the C-suite for the law firm. So the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the CMO, who report up to the president, who is the owner of the business. So you are the president. You are the owner. You pick where you want to go, how quick you want to get there. Uh, what style you want to get there? You pick the revenue targets. You say this is how I this is how I want the culture of my business to be. This is the life I want my business to give me. And then your CEO, your COO, your CFO, your CMO, their job is to create the processes, the systems, and procedures to make that to make that happen for you. In large law firms, 
Every large law firm has a CEO. They call that person a managing partner. Every large law firm has a COO, a chief operating officer. They usually call that person a professional legal administrator. Every large law firm has a chief financial officer. Well, why do you think they have these positions? Because that's what is needed for a business to run properly. So we provide that service as a, as a, as a timeshare temporary solution until the law firm grows up and is ready to bring that position in-house. So, and that's the part that I'm so interested by, because like, obviously there's a, is there a low end point where somebody's not yet ready for how to manage or a program similar to that? Or is that, is anybody okay for that? It's just, it's growing out of it. So it's a really interesting question because the, the right advice is not usually the best advice in this case. So let me explain. The right advice goes like this. If you want to grow your law firm from zero dollars in revenue, like you're just starting and you want to have a million dollar firm just cranking along, just firing on all cylinders working for you in like 48 months, go all in right in the beginning, right? That's the right advice. But maybe that's the best advice. The point I'm making is, most people won't do that. So what we do is we provide a stair step solution to ease people into it as their business grows, right? So the first stair step is what we call small law firm university, where you get assigned a practice management advisor who kind of like helps you get your shit together, generally speaking. You'll have a business plan, you'll have a marketing plan, You'll have key performance indicators for your marketing plan. You'll have a sales strategy that converts prospective new clients into paying clients without you having to be there all the time yourself doing it. You'll have some basic in, uh, processes and systems and procedures so you can start to create some infrastructure and some and some order in your business. And that way you can start hiring, training, managing better people and managing them with systems instead of managing them by just screaming at them. Um, we put some basic, which, which is a very common lawyer management technique, right? Just raising your voice. It's a very bad. Yes. And common. Um, and, and, and by the way, you missed your cue where you were supposed to say amen and hallelujah, because your business legal ease, you love it. You love it when your clients have a marketing plan and key performance indicators, because then they're able to make better rational decisions and really recognize and appreciate the value of what you do. A thousand percent. It is amazing to me how many people want us to give them the unlimited flow of water and have no buckets to carry it anywhere. You know, the, the best way to ruin a poorly managed business is with great marketing. <laughs> that's, I like that. That's a good saying. And that's what you see all the time, right? I mean, and that's kind of how you and I met. You and I met because you're like, how is it that all of our best clients all have something in common? Well, because our members know how much business they want you to get for them, and they know what they're going to do with the business you get for them. And they don't want more business than you can get for them because they know the limitations of their factory as it stands today. And then when they're when they when we build more capacity, then they come back to you and say, now I'm ready to bring me more. Well, and they have the opportunity to fulfill the extra work as opposed to then struggling with that part of it. Right. Um, so I, I forgot where I was going. I felt like I got off on a little tangent. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Um, you were you were trying to give me a shout out, so I'll, I'll take the tangent. Um, you were yeah. talking about the how to manage university, the first level yeah, so, of so getting people to that. We have we have how to manage a we we have small law firm, uh, small law firm university which gets the foundation in place. Think of it like the ice cream cone, right? Then, then the first scoop is one of our C-suites of services. Usually the first thing we're gonna do is put a CFO in place to help you really get control of the finances and build a proper financial model. Or depending on where your firm is at, maybe the first thing you need is a chief operating officer because maybe by this point you've already got some staff and things are starting to run amok and you got to put some structure in place to start getting your staff to be more profitable so they don't spend their whole day ruining your life asking you a million questions that could be solved with good processes. Or maybe the first role is the chief executive officer, CEO, 
uh, to, to put, you know, kind of like higher level strategies in place. So it depends on where you come out of small law firm university, whether the first thing is a CEO, a COO, a CFO, or a CMO, chief marketing officer. Um, we, we mix and match that. But the point I'm making is at around $250,000, you generally need at least one. Usually it's a CEO or a CFO. Around 250 to 500,000 in gross revenue, you usually need a chief operating officer because at that point you're starting to st you're starting to get a staff, and that staff needs processes and systems and procedures. Otherwise, you end up with a, a room full of people burning your money while they wait for you to answer questions. Right? You want to empower them with systems. Uh, by the time you get the firm up to around half a million dollars in revenue, by the time you get the firm up to about half a million dollars in revenue, which is only about $40,000 a month, it's only about $10,000 a week. It's not really that much. Um, you need a chief financial officer because now the nickels and dimes that didn't matter, they're starting to matter, right? And then we get them up to around a million and a half, $2 million in revenue. And typically that's where we come to you and say, look, it's now time to bring in a full-time chief operating officer and replace us. You've outgrown us as your timeshare fractional COO. You need to bring in a full-time professional legal administrator. We get around 3 million, 4 million in revenue, and it's time to replace us as the chief financial officer. We get up to around five to $7 million in revenue. And you know sometimes it's time at that point to talk about replacing us as the CEO. Um, so the idea is we we are we are meant to be a a bridge to get you from here to there, and not everyone wants to go the whole distance. Lots of people are very happy with a one or two million dollar law firm, and they never really want to bring these positions in house. And that's great for us. That's why we've got members uh, who have been with us since 2010. Lots of them, 2010, 2011, 2012. Lots of people who've been with us for that long and long uh, for that long. Well, you get so many attorneys focused on that having a million dollar firm, that gross revenue, as opposed to focusing on the profit or what the take home becomes for them. Yeah. Who gives a shit if you have a million dollar firm, if you're broke and you're working 24 hours a day, the goal is to get a business that works for you and you can step away. So one of the, th one of the things we're really well known for is not just helping people get to a million dollars in revenue really, really, really fast. We're also really well known for getting your business to get set up so that you can step away from it for 30 consecutive days with emergency access only. That's when you know you've really made the switch from having a practice to truly having a business that works for you. Well, and that's and that's the part that, I don't wanna say cracks me up, but like exactly what you're talking about. Like that's how every other business is run. And for so long, I probably because of law school, like we've been this ivory tower of legal that prevents us from having true business strategy in place or true business positions or true, you know, C-level uh, employees? Well, look, I mean, it's easy to blame the victim, right? But the, the fact of the matter is, if, if your law school professors tell you not to worry about the business side of the law firm, just be a good enough lawyer and the rest will just somehow take care of itself by magic, you know, a lot of people go to law school, you know, they're kind of young, they're kind of naive to the ways of the world. They they think they can trust their professors. They don't really know that their professors may not really know how the world really works. Um, and then they get their first job out of law school. And let's face it, there's a lot of law firm owners who they don't know what they're doing. They believe their professors. So they're running their business. They're running their law firm like a crazy house. And so they, they give bad advice to their first mentee, right? Uh, or sometimes the owner of the law firm, it's not necessarily in their best interest to let the law, the, the, the first year or the second year lawyer understand how the business mm -hmm. of the firm works, right? You know, that's true. I hired you to come in and do this work. Just sit in your office and do the work. Go to court and do the work. Do the depositions and do the work. Just do the work. Don't worry about what's happening in the business. That's my problem. I'm running my business. You just do the work. And sometimes I think that a lot of young, impressionable lawyers come to some very wrong conclusions about what's really making the business work.
Makes total sense. So where do you see, like, what do you see to be the easiest way for lawyers to get over that or make that switch? Like that, I, how much of that has to be internal and how much of that is hitting rock bottom? Sadly, most of our members, we call them members, come to us uh, either in a state of inspiration or a state of desperation. It's exciting when they come to us when they're inspired. They've had a taste of success and now they realize, oh, wow, I had a taste of success and I don't even know anything. Imagine what would happen if I got some help and put some structure around this and boom, we take it up, right? Sadly, a lot of people don't come to us until they have rock bottom or pretty close to it. And now they're desperate. I really, really, really wish people would come to us before the shit has hit the fan. It would be so much more fun and so much better. Um, you know, but what are you going to do? You know, most people, most people don't really get serious about losing weight or getting into shape or fixing anything in their life until they're inspired or desperate. That's just the human condition. Well, it's, it's the heading towards pleasure or running away from pain. There you go. Makes total sense. So, all right. So we've got how to manage. We've got 120 something people at this point. What's your kind of day to day more like? 120 em employees, you mean? Right, right. Yeah. Not, yeah, not yeah. members. Yeah. We manage over almost 600 law firms. Yeah. We got about 120 full time employees. Right. So, in that role, like what are, what are you doing on the day to day? You know, as you're helping these firms build up to them being that president, I'm curious to hear the, uh, the Arjun day. Well, Let's begin with, I practice what I preach. I am on this journey with you and all of our members. I'm maybe a few steps ahead of some. We have some members whose firms are much bigger than mine. Oh, um, you still have your firm? No, no, no. Uh, how to manage a small law firm, I call my firm. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, how to manage a small law firm... Uh, in 2021, grossed a little over $22 million. This year, 2022, we're tracking to about 27 million this year. Um, we have members whose firm, we, we have a member, our, our largest member, his firm is $60 million, just to give you some context. But the vast, vast, vast majority are under a million dollars. Most of our, our sweet spot is 500,000 to about 3 million in revenue. Uh, that's kind of the bell curve. Um, so a day in the life. I practice what I preach. Um, man, I can't even tell you a day in the life. Let me put it this way. I work, you've heard the term working on your business, working in your business. Yes. I work in my business about 90 days per year. Um, if I wanted to, I could work about 90 days this year and the rest of the year I could be out on my boat playing with my son. I guess I could learn to play golf. Um, so what am I doing? Um, we run a live quarterly meeting that all of our members come to. It's in a different city every, every time. Um, I, I prepare the live quarterly meeting and then I facilitate the live quarterly meeting. That's about four weeks out of the year. I, um, I have two high-end groups that I myself run. Uh, one is called the Overnight Success Club. Uh, Minimum revenue to get into that is at least $500,000 a year of total owner benefit income and a minimum net worth of $5 million. And that group, we meet three times a year for three days. So that's call it another two weeks out of the year. Um, I have another group that's called Iron Sharpens Iron. We meet three times a year, three days. That's another two weeks out of the year. Um, what else am I doing? Um once a quarter, I have a, a two-day meeting with my with my senior leadership team. Uh, once a month, I have one or sometimes two days. What I do is I batch all of my stuff at the same time. So 
So if I'm going to have, like, I'd, I'd rather take all of my administrative meetings, like, like I'll, I'll meet with all of the department heads to talk about their budgets all in one day. So it's just like one day of financial, 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 financial. Fin that is some level 100 block scheduling right there. That's the day, you know, that like I'm going out and having a beer afterwards, you know, um, I, uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I I could pull out my calendar and show this to you. I'm 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 at home. If I was in the office today, I could I could literally turn my calendar around and show you. I've got the, the next thing. 12, 18 months planned out on my wall, and and most of what's on that calendar is developing new initiatives, uh, tearing down and reinventing parts of the business that are already working pretty well. Um, that's what I mean, like working on the business instead of working in the business. I, I working in the business is pretty much two weeks once a quarter on the live quarterly meeting uh two days once a quarter on revisiting revising updating the business plan with all the department heads two or three days once a quarter on financial controls and just kind of reviewing key performance indicators and metrics and then a couple of programs that i run myself and and then and then here's the cool thing i get to do whatever i want to do in the business and this is one of the things that a lot of lawyers tell me, and it shows a lot of misunderstandings about how this really works. I say, we talk about getting a business to work for you and you could be away for 30 days with emergency access only and the business works for you and all that. And like, but I love practicing law. I don't want to stop practicing law. And the answer is fantastic. No one said you have to practice. You, no one said you have to stop practicing law, but let me tell you, it's a lot more fun to practice law it's a lot more fun to do what I do because I want to do it. Right. Where I want to do it for who I want to do right. it. It's a lot more fun practicing law when you want to practice law for the cases that really turn you on and excite you as opposed to just the daily grind, daily grind, daily grind. Well, I always tell people it's the difference between getting to do it and having to do it. And it's, it's so huge in that mindset. And I think it, you, and I think you find an easier time really putting yourself into it when it's not something you have to do but instead it's something that you get to do. Yeah, it's interesting you're asking me this question and I'm kind of struggling to give you an answer because I, I have a couple of young guys who are producing a documentary about kind of like the life of the owner of a eight figure business and they're following me around for two months. We're, we're, we're one month into them following me around for two months to kind of like see what it's like. And like, I sometimes feel like I need to show off for them or something because it seems really boring and underwhelming. Like they're, they're like, but, but, but I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of doing nothing again today, <laughs> but we need well, to get some footage. Like, well, that's, this is all I do. You know, I don't do much. But that's the thing is, you know, I, you had a, I think either you had it or it's coming up on your social. You had like the day in the life with the 12 to 18 month planning. And I just think that's so amazing to be able to have the ability to focus on that far out. I think so many attorneys we talk to are focused on, the court hearing tomorrow or the one they're driving to now or something. And the more you take that longer view, the easier I think it is to work backwards into the day to day. That's largely a vocabulary problem. What do you mean? The word docket and the word mean the same Oops. thing. Sorry, I, you're cutting out or I'm cutting the word, out. Can you hear me? Yeah, the doc, I heard the word docket and then. The, the word docket, I'll start it again. The word docket and the word calendar are used interchangeably, but they don't mean the same thing. Those are two very different tools. It's like having a wrench and having a screwdriver. Screwdriver is exactly what you need if what you've got is a screw, but it's terrible for turning a nut or a bolt. If you For that, you need a wrench. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. A docket is a is is a is a is how you manage your clock time how you manage this hour next hour next hour next hour for the next couple of weeks in advance that's a docket a calendar is by its definition a long range strategic planning tool that's what calendars were invented mm. for by the egyptians a thousand years ago 
Calendars were not invented by the Egyptians a thousand years ago to figure out what to do between two o'clock and three o'clock next Thursday. That's what a docket is for. Calendars were invented to predict the seasons, to predict the tides, to predict when the Nile was going to flood, to predict when do we need to start planting our seeds, when do we need to start getting our act, getting our act together so we can start harvesting the crops. That's what calendars were were, were invented for. Most people are not using their calendar for its strategic planning purposes. They're using the calendar as a, as a bad docket. And so, you know, if no one ever taught you, look, I mean, if no one ever taught you what this thing was for, for those of you who don't know, this is a pen. Maybe they're not watching. I mean, um, <laughs> I don't think anyone doesn't know what this is if they're looking. At right. It. But we, if no one ever taught you what this is, I mean, imagine giving this to a caveman with no instructions. They, they, they just wouldn't know what to do with it, right? And if no one ever taught you what a calendar was for, and they told you a calendar and a docket are the same thing, well, then the idea of long-range strategic planning would be very, very confusing and intimidating and scary. And then if everyone around you was using their calendar like a docket, I mean, who's going to be your positive role model? It's true. You got nowhere to look. Man, you've, you've tapped into my, I was a history major. So you tapped into my inner uh, history nerd with that whole Egyptian calendar purpose. It makes total sense though. Yeah. So from the standpoint of having run a law firm, having overseen, you know, work with a bunch through the Florida bar and obviously how to manage now with, you know, 600 or more firm members that you're working with. Are there consistent problems or issues that you see your clients having, or is, does everybody have their own individual problem? Uh, yes, there, there are some very consistent, predictable, common problems that no one is going to name after you if you discover you have this problem too, right? It's like no one wants to name, no one wants the disease named after them. Ah. Right? You want to go to the doctor. You want the doctor to say, okay, that's terrible. That's painful. That's excruciating. That's horrible. But you know what? We've seen that a million times. We know exactly what it's all about. We have a proven system for treating it and making it better. You don't want the doctor going, oh my God, we've never seen that before. We're going to call this the Jordan Ostroff disease. No one wants that, right? That is very true. There, there's, there's like literally, I can't remember the last time someone brought me a problem with the management or marketing or sales or anything of a small law firm that I hadn't seen a hundred times before. Like I, I, I haven't been... I haven't been surprised by anything in 10 years because law firms are just not that complicated, right? So what are some of the common problems? You ready? Yep. Number one, they fail to make a distinction between the business of the law firm and the job of the lawyer, the business of the law firm and the job of the lawyer. If you confuse the business of the law firm with the job of the lawyer, you are screwed. All right. Uh, number two, they uh, they don't answer this question correctly. The question, and, and I and I pose this question to thousands and thousands and thousands of lawyers, and no one in every audience that I pose this to, I present it this way. I said, I'm going to ask you a question, but before I ask you the question that I'm actually going to ask you, let me be clear on the question that I I am not asking you, right? I am not asking you this question. So don't anyone answer this question because this is not the question I'm asking you. And you know, inevitably, in every audience, every time for 10 years, someone raised their hands and asked the question, I'm explicitly not asking them, right? So the question that I am not asking you is how much do you need your law firm to give you financially. I'm not asking how many hours are you willing to work. I'm not asking what you can do without. I'm not asking what you can put up with. 
I'm not asking you how much you'll endure. What I am asking you is how much does it cost to live the way you want to live? What I am asking you is how many hours per week on average, and I know some will be more, some will be less, but on average, how many hours per week do you want to give to your business? What I am asking is what kind of professional impact do you want to use your business to make in the world? Hmm. And inevitably, because lawyers are trained to believe in the doctrine of sacrifice by all the way from law school, all the way through, inevitably, lawyers have a very hard time establishing honest goals. How much does it really cost to live with the way you honestly want to live? What kind of house do you honestly want to live in? What kind of car do you want to drive? What kind of vacations do you want to take? What kind of domestic services do you want to employ? What kind of education do you want to give your children? What kind of vacations do you want to take? What kind of charities do you want to support? How do you want to live your life? And then let's calculate that number and plug it into the calculation for the law firm business plan. And boop, 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 boop. This is how many, this is, this is, this is your marketing plan. This is oh, your sales plan. You've made it proactive instead of reactive. You force them to have to be intentional about it. You know, one of the, everyone says they want to be free, but no one wants to take responsibility for freedom. And the first responsibility of freedom is making decisions for how you want to live your life. And so what people do, what lawyers do is they end up saying, well, I figure the best I can hope for is I'll settle for everyone around me is who the fuck cares what everyone around you is doing? How do you want to live your life? Right. And, 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 and this is a very common problem that we have because the answer to this question drives every other aspect of the business. I can give you an example if you, if we've got time or we can move on. We've got uh, about 10 minutes. Let me give you a simple example. Okay. All right. This, by the way, is why how to manage a small law firm clients are your best clients because they've all done this calculation, right? So let's say for argument's sake that we say it's going to cost uh, $200,000 to live the way you want to live, okay? Yep. Getting out my phone because I need a calculator because I can't do math. I'm we not checking my texts, all right? No, no MBA for you, I know. So $200,000 to live the way you want to live. Just throwing a number out there to illustrate a point. Yes? Yep. And let's say that you determine that the firm is going to work at a at a 25% total owner benefit margin. Make sense? Yep. So we take $200,000 divided by 0.25, and that tells us that the firm has to gross $800,000. If the firm grosses $800,000 and operates at a 25% total owner benefit margin, that means you've got your $200,000. Pretty simple, right? Uh, simple, but not easy. We don't need a million dollar firm, right? but a $750,000 firm won't do it for us either. We need around an $800,000 firm. Very simple. All right. Now, if we figure that the average case value is, let's say, throw out a number. Let's, we'll do five grand, make it a $5,000, right? And then lawyers say, well, I don't know. No one can predict what the average case value is going to be. And the answer is that's not true. If you if you opened and close if you close a hundred cases in a year, and you gross eight hundred thousand dollars, it means your average case value was eight thousand dollars. This is math, right? Yep. But you're saying we're going to use five thousand. Fine. So we'll take eight hundred thousand dollars divided by five thousand dollars gives us one hundred and sixty cases. So 800,000 divided by $5,000, average case value equals 160 cases. You see that? Yep. All right. Now, what's your average conversion rate? In other words, out of every prospective new client that LegalEase Marketing serves up to you, 
what is your conversion rate? Is it 100%? Is it one out of 10? Is it one out of five? Is it 33%? What is your average conversion rate? And again, people are like, well, I can't predict that. It's not a prediction. It's a historical record of what has happened in the past 12 months. It's simple math. You met with 100 prospects and you got 25 clients. It means you have a 25% conversion rate. We can work on making it better in the future, but let's just start there. Let's just say an average conversion rate of one out of three. Okay. Okay. Um, so we take 160 divided by 0.33, one out of three. 160 divided by 0.33 uh, is 485 prospects. See that? Okay. So now we, so now 485 prospects divided by 12 months, 485 divided by 12 is 40 a month. So now we go to legalese marketing and we say, hey, legalese marketing, I want to take $200,000 in total owner benefits out of my firm to live the way I want to live. I figure my firm is going to run at a 25% total owner benefit margin. That means I need the firm to gross around $800,000. My average case value is around $5,000. So I need 160 cases per year. I convert at one out of three. So I need you to give me 485 cases uh, prospects per year or around 40 per month and if you give me 50 this month and you give me 50 next month and you give me 50 the month after that i'm going to come to you and i'm going to say dial it down stop bringing me so much business because i didn't build my factory to process 50 cases a month uh, i didn't build my factory to process at that many cases i only built my factory to process 160 cases a year which means I only need 485 per uh, prospects per year. I don't need 600 prospects per year. 600 prospects per year is too much. Slow down. You're going to sink me, right? Because if you got 40 uh, prospects a month, now you're going to hire one full-time person to meet with those prospects. Not a half a person, not three people, right? If you can hey. handle... If you can handle 160 cases a year, 160 cases a year divided by 12, you're going to, let's just say 13 a month. That means you're going to have two attorneys and one paralegal, not three attorneys and two paralegals, not one attorney and three paralegals. You're going to have a certain staffing ratio, which means you're also going to have a certain number of computers. So we know what your IT budget needs to be. We know what you got to be doing with in terms of your malpractice. We know what you need to do in terms of your physical plan. We know how much coffee you better buy. Your business and your life start to be very predictable when you do some very simple math. I mean, you saw how complex this is, right? I mean, I didn't use a spreadsheet. There's no complex mathematical formulas here or computer code. This is how people have been running successful law firms for generations. This is what I learned at the Florida Bar Law Office Management Assistance Service. Makes total sense. It's not about more. It's about having the right numbers that fit the right uh, algorithm, formula. Well, it's about how, look, it starts with how do you want to live your life? And how much does it cost to live the way you want to live your life? And then let's build a business and dial it in to give you that life, right? Let's make it give you that much money. Let's make sure we dial it in to give you that much freedom. Let's make sure we dial it in to give you uh, the ability to make the kind of professional impact in the world that you want to make. All right, so... So we're talking about mistakes that lawyers make, uh, and, and, and this is a very common mistake, right? They won't answer this question. They just won't answer this question. It's kind of like, it's kind of crazy, right? Because like, how do you go to a jury and say, award my client whatever you feel like awarding them? I mean, you have to have a number, right? You have to have a number. You don't just go into a divorce, oh, award my client however much child support you feel like. Give my client however much damages you want. I mean, lawyers 
treat their own business and their own family to such a lower standard than they treat their clients that it's freaking embarrassing. All right. So this is a common problem. You want to know common mistakes. Um, well, so I just want to jump in. We've got two minutes left. All right. Sorry. No, no, total. Listen, like I said, I knew there was, there was zero chance we were going to go early on this one. Cause I know you and I could talk all day. Um, but in those last two minutes, is there anything else you want to make sure we cover or should I just go right into our final takeaway? I think that most of your clients are not taking full enough advantage of their access to you. Because in addition to talking about marketing, they ought to talk to you about business. Number one. Number two, I think that if your clients would do this kind of calculation, they would get a lot more value out of the services you provide. And that's not a knock against you. It's an encouragement to them. And they would be able to see objectively the value that you provide for them. And then they wouldn't want to stop doing business with you. Uh, number three, you know, hold yourself to the same standards, I'm speaking to your audience, please hold yourself to the same standards that that for the business, the way you run your business as the way you practice law. You wouldn't take a case to trial without a trial strategy. You wouldn't put an, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take a case to trial without expert witnesses. You wouldn't take a case to trial without knowing, you without, without having calculations for the damages, right? Uh, you wouldn't sit down and do a deposition without a strategy. And yet lawyers run their business to a much, much lower standard than that. And I think that it is it is is disappointing. I love that, it. It's it is so true. All right. So I want to get I want to be honor everybody's time. We got this book for an hour. Um, Arjun, thank you so much for joining us today. Before I let everybody go, I do want to remind everybody our next episode will air next Thursday, February 10th, 4 p.m. Eastern with Regina Edwards. She's going to talk to us about client boundaries versus handholding, how you can wow your clients and still have a life. But with that being said, for everybody interested, we've got all of Arjun's links for how to manage and everything here in on Facebook. Um, otherwise, if you're listening to this as a podcast, if you jump on the Facebook or search for how to manage, they will come up. And Arjun, seriously, thank you so much for your time. Jordan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And um, let's keep talking once this ends. Absolutely. All right, so now...